could we differentiate the camo system to the FAA regulatory of how they do their managing of the fleet? Okay, uh, it was a nice question, but the question is actually uh, two or three days long. Why? Because the FAA and EASA do things in a very, very different way. And first of all, you've got to understand that the FAA uh, is the regulatory authority for the USA. Uh, the USA is a little bit smaller, but not that much in the big picture, the entire European Union with 30 odd countries. And so we, on one side, we've got one regulatory authority. On the other side, we've got 30 plus regulatory authorities working underneath an umbrella, which is the ASA. So the FAA way of doing things is quite different. It's more direct. They have people who we call, for example, uh, DAR, Designated Airworthiness Representative, or Designated Engineering Representative. These people work directly within the FAA system. So, for example, if you have uh, damage uh, and it's, it needs a minor repair, under the FAA system, that minor repair can be approved on Form 337 by a DER, Designated Engineering Representative. In the ASA system, it has to be a Part 21. So there are so many differences uh, between the FAA and the ASA. What's happened is they've harmonized the output, the outcomes. So uh, looking after an aeroplane the FAA way is not safer or not less safe than looking at the aeroplane the EASA way. Uh, it's just a different way of achieving the, the, the same results. So as we said, uh, there are a number of documents be that sit between the FAA and the EASA. If you're familiar, you'll know about the, the uh, Maintenance Annex Guidance, the MAG, which is at Change 8. You can get hold of these from the EASA website. So the Maintenance Annex Guidance tells how 145 organizations work. Uh, so an, a European 145 looking after the FAA aircraft would be doing it in accordance with the Maintenance Annex Guidance. Uh, and an FAA 145 looking after EASA would also be doing it in accordance with the MAG. There's also uh, airworthiness issues related to certification of the aircraft, and they're covered by another document, which is called the Technical Implementation Procedures. Uh, as it mentions, EASA requires independent QA. The FAA does not have the same requirements for independent QA. Uh, the FAA talks a lot more about QC, even though sometimes they use the term QA. For example, uh, you will be familiar with a, a, a critical task, 145A48 uh, a critical task inspection. Uh, the FAA has something similar, and it's called a uh, RII, required inspection item. And a person that certifies the required inspection item will tell you that I am QA, you're QA, but you're working on the check and you're signing required inspection items. Yes, sir. I said, well, that's not what I understand by QA. And so it's how you interpret it. We need to interpret QA the way EASA wants us to, which is quality assurance is always independent and quality control is uh, part and parcel of the production system. Uh, okay, what else? Uh, the FAA does not work with type license. The FAA a &P is a basic license only. So EASA uh, focuses heavily without doing a technical course and getting the uh, license endorsed, your license endorsed, the company can't give you certification approval. That doesn't work like that under the FAA system. So quite different. 
they have something which they call CAMP, C-A-M-P, Continuing Airworthiness Maintenance Programme. Uh, it's a requirement for all Part 21 aircraft. And Part 21 is basically, as it says here, uh, AOC, uh, more than 30 passengers. So that's uh, Part 21. And so it's required for Part 21. Also required for Part 135, uh, which is 10 or more passengers. And as it says, a Part 135 operator provides commercial non-scheduled aircraft operations. So uh, jets, business jets, typically would operate as 